to meet me with the old Dutch lady, traveling through the dawn. Together we're starting a new journey, a voyage of discovery. The moment is full of possibility and a touch of fear, fear of the unknown. They're traveling through the world of human beings and human gods. I am in the wilderness. to make a journey like this without being changed by it. In our everyday lives, we put up barriers to keep certain things at bay. We close our ears to the voices of our ancestors. But the water dissolves those barriers and opens us to the many layers of culture that lie beneath the here and now. The cliche says that travel broadens the mind. I'm more interested in depth than breadth. But to make a journey, you must be a practical mystic. You must have a map which shows a route from Ballinasloe in County Galway to Drumshambo in County Leitrim. Ballinasloe was a port once, and this was the harbour. But it's been stranded by the outgoing tide of history on a reef of old limestone. The empty eyes of windows stare out at nothing. Recession is not just a modern hazard. Waves of unemployment have been crashing on this shore for decades. Walls etched with lichen, where the bargemen used to tie when the Grand Canal came this far. Observe what isn't here. Listen to the silence. Half a century of dereliction. This canal will never see a boat again. The trees are reclaiming their inheritance. I must leave Ballinasloe by a humble ditch. The route has been diverted by history. My purpose is to reach the River Suck and travel down to make the assignation. My boat is a Shannon angling cot, a design the Vikings left behind them in the estuary a thousand years ago. It's a sort of time machine. And my muscles soon develop a pleasant rhythm in tune with the journey. There's a good current helping us along our time flow, but the practical difficulties of river travel prevent too much distraction of the mind. They keep you occupied. But lurking on the bank are dangers of a more sinister kind. Giant hog. 
Dogweed is a plant that was introduced into Ireland um, back in the late 1800s. But uh, in the recent past, say in the last 15 to 20 years, the plant has begun to spread quite rapidly throughout our river corridors. I suppose one of the main reasons why we are concerned about the unwarranted spread of the plant is because it represents quite a serious human health hazard. If one is to break the leaves or the stem, the skin becomes inflamed and within a few hours fairly se very serious blisters, very painful blisters uh, erupt in the skin. Simply and solely my advice to anyone in the vicinity of this plant is stay well clear of it. Even brushing against it can elicit the response uh, I spoke about earlier. I'm travelling to an assignation, a meeting with old friends. Dick and Declan Carney have shared past adventures with me. They've brought Scolivar, the old Dutch lady, as far upriver as she can go. Scolivar is a barge yacht. She was built in Holland in 1913 for gentlemen to race in. The First World War put a damper on her sporting debut, but she did spend a decade or two racing across the Dutch inland seas and was lucky enough to travel to Eastern England before the Second World War broke out. From there, she sailed to Ireland and cruised our coasts and inland waterways in the late 40s and 50s. In the 70s, she was discovered a rusting abandoned hull in an estuary in County Cork and lovingly restored to prepare her for a second century. Good to see her, Jen. is also one of the last of a heroic breed, the boatsmen. And his son Declan has, by inheritance and acquisition, many of Dick Carney's old skills. Dick made the journey from Ballinasloe to the Shannon in the old days, along the now derelict canal. There are plans to dredge the suck which runs parallel to the old canal line and put locks on it so the navigation will again stretch that far for bigger boats than cots. We are moving on, waltzing gently round the bends with the current urging at the boat's broad buttocks, caught up again by the momentum of river cruising. History is also a travel story. Barges go and railways come, and railways in their turn feel the unkind breath of progress. I find it gives me a sense of perspective. Did I ever believe that I'd be standing here now with you in a branch of of the Grand Canal, where boats ran by, where children and where people fished and where people swam, and now it's just a solid bed with a three-foot steel river lying laid down and trains going back and forward every day. 
as you know, laying down railway line on bog can create many, many major problems, but the actual bed of the old canal was a ready-made bed for us. Progress is progress. I would be a bit sorry about it, but I mean, if you, if you bear in mind what the development of the bogs in the Midlands of Ireland and in this part of the country as well has done for the economy of this country, then you just can't be sorry. Progress is progress, and even the yellow bog gobblers look as though they're on their way to join the dinosaurs. Technology is such a transient thing. The engineers don't design for beauty or for permanence. Progress is progress, and it rolls on steel bogies across the soft belly of the bog. place near here. For nearly a thousand years it was one of the most important places in the land. Tucked into the elbow of country between the Shannon and the Suck, at a great confluence of waterways, lies Clonfert. Well it goes back to St. Brendan the Navigator who is a very obvious connection with, with water. Uh, originating in Ard Firth in County Kerry at the beginning of the 6th century and dying at his other, one of his other foundations in Anadown, also in County Galway, as this cathedral is, uh, in the end of the, the 6th century. And then it is said that he, he's buried here and he died either 577 or 584. This was started, according to whoever you believe, around in the 1160s, is the simplest way of saying it. And the Great West Door is regarded as the high point of the Hibernian, Hiberno-Romanesque. It is it's just, it is superb. And it, it has all sorts of decorations that are not found in, in other Hiberno-Romanesque de decorations. Uh, and they seem to have Scandinavian roots, which is very interesting. Again, <laughs> Vikings and and travelling across water. For me, the adventurers who travelled across water have become a metaphor of Irish history. St. Brendan, the other holy men, the Vikings and the traders. They are what made us. The present is a product of this past. Log of the Scolivar, day one. Clonfert is a strange place. It oozes with time, is noisy with ancestors. I feel a strange compulsion to revisit it before the journey can continue, to see the ruined bishop's palace behind the church. It's a location where I could put the theory to the test, the theory that my voyage consists only of an accumulation of previous voyages along the river that the water is dissolving the barriers and the Jungian voices of the past are on the verge of audibility.
come here looking for something, but it's a little hard to explain exactly what it is. But I'm a bit nervous, using the rational part of my brain to quell the uneasy messages coming from the other part. Why should the past be frightening? Ghosts can't threaten me. It's quite ridiculous to believe that a ruined building invaded by trees has any significance beyond the obvious. My ancestors are important to me because they've contributed to what I am. They've made a cultural bequest. But they're not required to appear. They should restrict their manifestations to the realm of theory. I think I'll go. Quit while I'm ahead. Leave before I'm upstaged by dead men looking for a piece of the action. proceeds back to its proper place. The sheer pleasure of travelling on the river is all that counts. This is a beautiful country, and I think there's no better way to see it than from a boat. In general, houses keep away from the river bank, afraid of getting their feet wet in winter floods. The horizons are so big, the edges soft and green, the movements liquid and soothing. The great meeting of the waters where the big river Suck joins the great river Shannon brings me back to the 20th century and its self-confident achievements. Shannon Bridge a key attracting pleasure cruisers like iron filings on a magnet. An old bridge of countless arches. Buildings that hinted a past more self-important even than the present. Here are people getting other pleasures from the river. here but I think that you really do need to keep the fish going back in because uh, without the fish you've got no nobody to come here and fish for our, take the holidays over here. This spot along here at Shannon Bridge is a very favourite spot for a lot of the anglers that are coming over from England especially and green is really the, the fish they're after. It's you against the fish. The, you, somewhere out there, there's, there's a shoulder green. You're sat here and you're trying to, to locate them and trying to get them to feed. It really is the whole uncertainty of, of going out fishing and not knowing whether you're going to catch a nice tench or a, or a nice bag of green. with pollution, they're always there waiting, you know, in the dream. 
and road especially can be can be affected by pollution. Um, but I'm glad to say in this area the um, we've been free of, of any pollution. But uh, it's always lurking. I think everybody has to be so diligent. boat's nose against the current and travel on northwards from Shannon Bridge and its shoals of green. There's good water under the keel and I can open the throttle and feel the solid Dutch response as Scullivar shoulders aside the water, making time as well as any modern plastic cruiser. I like her prow, rearing up, a swan's neck or a Viking longship. I swing around a bend in the river and come face to face with another chapter of history. Well, the two main factors that make Clonmacnoise one of Ireland's premier uh, early historic monument sites uh, is that the fact that it contains the grave of the founding saint, St. Ciaran, and that it's sited on the crossroads of Ireland. We have the River Shannon and the Great Escarie, the or Great Early Road of the early Christian period coming from Dublin across the country. Rape and pillage, I think, is the, the, the words that most people associate with the site from their school history books. Uh, also, I think the bad press is normally associated with the Vikings but the, from research uh, through the annals, we see that uh, we had our own uh, homegrown vandals at the time. And I think the score sheet at the moment reads something like 23 strikes uh, for the Irish, 10 strikes uh, for the Vikings, and a me measly three by the English. Raiding parties from the water ran in light armor up this hill, swinging swords. The Viking incursions here are, are twofold, really, two main waves. The first one, every school uh, kid in Ireland probably knows about, and that's Turgis, Turgisor, the Viking chief, who is alleged to have come here in about 844 with a fleet, came down to attack Clonfert, came on here. Uh, eventually the following year uh, he was put to death, he was drowned by the king, great king, Mel Shockland Malachy the first. The smell of sweat and blood and fear, the hunger for treasure, the material against the spiritual. The second wave uh, in the 920s and 30s when the Limerick Vikings significantly, and they were always by the way a counterpost to the Dublin Vikings, they were the enemy of the Dublin Vikings, the, the Limerick men came up here, tried to control Loch Ree, and did so uh, for about 20 years in the 920s and 30s. The reason that they would control this area, would want to have done so, would be to attack all the monasteries. Now, 937, this all came to an end when the Limerick Vikings were defeated by the, the dubs of the day, 937, and the Limerick fleet was sunk here near Clonmacnoise, uh, in, 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 in Loch Ree very definite date in both Irish and English history because that was the year also that the Vikings, our North Irish, were defeated in England at the Battle of Brunanburh. Somehow history always appears to me in black and white images, but is actually full colour. The saints and the Vikings saw the same water, reeds and sky that I'm seeing 20 lifetimes later. Something else we share. We'll get to know each other better, these ancestors and myself, before this journey's over.
started in the angling cot, leaving Ballina slow to paddle down the sock and meet the others on Scullabar, the Dutch barge yacht. We travelled on down the river, past stories of the rise and fall of technology through a hundred years of history. And more, a thousand years, fifteen hundred, my ancestors the Vikings fighting with my ancestors the monks. And all the time we had the feeling we were being followed. After the raid on Clonmac Noise, we pushed northwards into the interior of the country. Scullabai is big, 40 feet, but she's dwarfed by the chamber. It's our first lock on this trip, but the routine is deeply ingrained. Everyone is in the right place at the right time. No hurry, no shouting. When you do it right, it's a bit like going up in a lift. The water fills the chamber, you float up a few feet, put the engine in gear, and you've gone up another step on the uphill journey towards the head of the river. One of the reasons why crossing places and border towns are important is that they're where different cultural traditions meet, mingle and change. The shallow summer flow coming over the weir is a reminder that this was the great ford on the border of Leinster and Connaught, and that it's always been a cultural treasure house, a temple of variety. Though if you come by car or train and speed over a bridge, you might just possibly miss all this. you might whiz through without ever learning that the greatest of all Irish tenors was born in a Chinese restaurant. Now there's what I mean. Cultures cross-pollinating, confrontations at the frontier post. No, it's best to arrive by boat and with a thirst, and have the courage to penetrate up dark alleys in search of other strands in the weave of Athlone. I spend a lot of time quietly picking Dick's brains, feeding off the storehouse of experience and knowledge he's gained from a long lifetime on the water. Wasn't a bad day's run. Nice day's run. We've got the lake tomorrow. Oh yeah, lovely. Mm. You worried about it? No, no, no. In many ways, he's the ideal companion for a trip like this. Quiet, competent, not given to panic, but fond of a pint and a song. I'm kind of looking forward to it myself. Good luck. Yeah. Oh, mate. <laughs> Log of the Scholar. Tomorrow we leave Athlone and head towards Loch Ree. The weather forecast is good, which is just as well. Lakes this size can be dangerous. We slip out of Athlone in the morning. Like many Irish river towns, it seems to turn its back to the water, almost as if it's ashamed of it. A bit of the glamour has dissolved with the night. The buildings seem grey and sober. I look forward to seeing more green to trees and reeds and callow land. Something else it has in common with other Irish towns, a skyline dominated by a church. 
a great Byzantine edifice crouching in symbolic mastery over the smaller buildings. The Victorian ironwork of the rail bridge is the best of the architecture around here. Also, I notice a very famous boat, the Fox, skipper Sid Shine. He lives on board, a man who holds another strand in Athlone's weave of cultures. I came into uh, the business because my parents built the Crescent Ballroom in 1936. And uh, I inherited the job of resident, carried on the resident band there. I built up then to one of the biggest big bands in the country. I had a 13 piece, he used to carry four saxes, two trumpets, two trombones, bass, piano, drums, and did a lot of the big jobs in the country, like Trinity Ball, and big dances in the west of Ireland and that. Well, 1963. Uh, the big band started to fade out and uh, as rock and roll came in, Bill Haley and the Comets put the tin hat on the big bands, I think. And uh, so if you can't make them, you have to join them. So I started the same show band at that time. I, I, I don't remember when I wasn't in a boat, you see, because my father and my uncle, so on, you know, they all had, they all had boats. And uh, when I was 14, myself and two of my school pals bought an old yacht here called the Elfin for six pounds. And we put an engine into it, an old Model T Ford engine into it that we bought for a pound. And got it, got it, got it moving, and we started to do the whole Shannon that time. And we brought her, brought her up, first time up to Lockheed, 1934. We thought that time we owned it all because we often went from Athlone to Carrick and Shannon and never met another boat on the way. From John McCormick to Sid Shine and the Saints, so many kinds of music, they make an easy metaphor for all the cultural strands that make up a modern Irish town. So the times when you could travel a day on the Shannon and never meet another boat are long gone. We won't be alone on our journey north, into the inner lakes, and then across the main body of Loch Ree to the Connaught shore. So much river travel is dominated by natural landscapes that it's quite a contrast to look at things made by people, bridges, houses, key walls and other objects crafted of masonry and metal. Monastic settlements are a recurring theme, but not all the monks are items of history. The Franciscans still have a community here. We're very much conscious here in Athlone as Franciscans of being, as we would say, Athlone's oldest family. We've been here for several hundred and fifty years, give or take a decade or two. You know, we're not worried about the exact figures. And when you're around that length of time, Time ceases to interest you. You know, you're timeless. You're always here. Well, obviously, when you're talking about Ireland in the 5th, 6th century, when the monks first came to the place, it was a land of marsh, bog,
navigator, Tregesius the Viking, Dean Swift's Gulliver, who came this way en route to Lilliput, and Goldsmith's country clergyman, passing rich on 40 pounds a year. As an Irishman, I carry ashore quite a weight of inherited baggage. And therefore, I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. Hare Island has a barricade of woodland round its shores. Only the centre is open country. It's like a tonsured head, and the barricade is manned. fire, purn in a gyre, and be the singing masters of my soul. There are treasures of another kind which still survive, botanical treasures. An awful lot of Ireland has been sort of completely scrunched up and eaten out by cattle by now, but here and there you get little gems, little fields where, where the cattle haven't done their worst, and suddenly you get the lot, I mean you get orchids, you get lots and lots and lots of different flowering plants, uh, something comes in, I say a seed falls on the ground. If that seed fell on the ground in the east of Ireland, the cows would be long, the sheep would be long, it'd wipe it out in 10 seconds. Uh, but over here within the Shannon system, uh, you know, just looking around here on Hare Island, there's, what, five, six, seven cattle on a whole island. So really, the amount of pressure that's on any young plant that's trying to become established is very, very slight here. That means that these things can get in and get established and sort of get up to maybe two, three metres high before they're likely to be browsed by anything. This is one of the rarest Irish roses. It's a thing called Rosa agrestis, the lesser sweetbriar. There are, as far as I know, there are only two sites left for it in the south of England. Uh, in Ireland, we've got 15 to 20 different sites, depending on what you call a site. If you like, it's a sort of a, a survival of the old agricultural landscape that we had two, three hundred years ago. The pink-flowered one is a thing called, that's oh, a lovely one, it's a thing called a, the downy rose. The, the leaves are actually covered with soft felt in the back. Most of the stuff that you get in the east of Ireland again is sort of poor hybrid material by now. But over here, where the true ordinary dog rose is very, very uncommon, it seems as if it hasn't had a chance to breed to the same extent with this one. So as a result of that, what you're seeing here is very, very pure stock. You know, people get a bit over, you know, I think excessively worked up about orchids for, for various reasons, because they obviously have a certain sort of appeal. But really, at the same time, the orchids are, um, if you like, they're a symptom. They're an expression of, of something being right with the world. We leave Treasure Island, and there are many symptoms of something being right with the world. The sun shines, though the panic has evaporated. Birds sing. When a boat lifts to a wave, my heart lifts with it. I wish I could sing too, but my best friends have long since told me that this isn't a great idea. Everyone tells me I have a great life. They don't really know what they're talking about, of course, but I suppose they're right in some ways, even if I can't make music. Instead, I turn the boat for the water labyrinth of the inner lakes, a sheltered, gentle place, a place where the truism comes true, and boating really is the ultimate in relaxation. 
Well, maybe it's a little more complicated than that. Maybe the nicest part of boating is when you stop, like banging your head against the brick wall. When you stop and tie up at another quiet jetty and chat to people in the sunshine. Well, basically we make our living through renting mooring space and uh, repairs and maintenance to most of the craft here. We, we build some boats, we used to build some boats, but uh, not so much now. Peter Quigley, before I joined him, he built a lot of the Shannon Wander vines for the uh, local, 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 local yacht club. And uh, fishing boats, for the lake, the lake boats here, the standard lockery, he started off in wooden boats and then he graduated to fiberglass. Well, after leaving school, um, I served my time to the tra traditional boat building here on the Shannon with a man by the name of Walter Living in Cruisen, with an old man there. And when I finished my time there with him, he gave me, he was retiring at the time, and he gave me practically his goodwill as well, which was a great benefit to me and there were timber fishing boats, Shannon One design boats that we were building at the time, and I continued on in that tradition for some years. Boating on the Shannon is changing a bit. People are going more and more for the cruisers now. Cruisers, big cruisers were here years and years back, big sailing cruisers on the Shannon. Now they're coming back again, and perhaps maybe slightly in a different form, some sailing boats and some cruisers, and people are looking for ease, easy access to these boats. As I slip Scolivar out into the calm water and thread a passage through the moored boats, I realise that this waterway is about industry and tourism, about jobs and potential. It always has been. The Midlands of Ireland have a resource that can be sensibly exploited. Dick Khan's days are gone. There are no more barge loads of grain and beer on the river. But there is still commerce of a kind. Today the cargo is pleasure, the trade is in enjoyment. what our earliest ancestors enjoyed is not easy. We can go back to ancient manuscripts, search for clues in old religions and oral traditions, piece together fragments. What emerges is consistent. The most fundamental of all human pleasures, crossing all barriers of time and culture, is an enjoyment of the beauties of nature. It's the ultimate aesthetic experience, and we have to visit no gallery, library or cinema. All we have to do is open our eyes and allow ourselves a sense of wonder as people always have. I lived to seven, eight, nine years old in Ireland. The older frogs have been found in other countries, but in Ireland they would be around eight years maximum age. Um, most frogs would probably, they mature, they breed for the first time at two or three years of age. Um, but most frogs would probably die off by the time they're five or six. But the oldest that I have found anyway is, is about eight years old. that given all the land drainage and stuff that's going on, um, particularly in the eastern part of the country over the last 20 years, um, I would say that there's been a pretty significant decline in frog populations because uh, a lot of ponds and uh, waterways that they would have used for breeding have, been, have disappeared over the last 20 years. Uh, in the west of Ireland, I would say that they're still, you know, they're doing pretty well.
But it's time to switch off daydreaming mode. There's work to be done. The lake must be crossed and pathetic fallacies have to be temporarily shelved while we accept that nature can also be an adversary. Every time I take the tiller of a boat in my fist and head across open water, I get a thrill. It's hard to describe exactly. A feeling of power, independence, excitement. I think one of the attractions of boat travel is that it's always an adventure. Childish, maybe, but also rejuvenating. And why not? St. Brendan's motives for tackling the Western Ocean were not purely spiritual. Those Vikings built a world empire on their taste for daring voyages. Adventure is an underestimated engine of achievement. Apart from adventure, there's something else which makes water travel very different. There's the immense sense of isolation it can produce. Isolation which frees the mind to travel in unexpected directions, to make connections, to hear what is seldom heard, to see the invisible. I revel in this journey. Let's keep her going. Stream from Ballina Slow. We headed on with the river flow through several centuries of history, past Clonfert and Clonmacnoise. Athlone is the town of the crossings and the gateway to Loch Ree. I met a lot on the way, some of it obvious, some obscure. inland sea that has a vastness of perspective that brings me back to the courage of the old navigators. To a Viking, this was the dark side of the moon. The peninsula of Rindun juts into the lake and provides a well-worn landfall. When those early explorers first penetrated its maiden mysteries, they must have been so scared by the wilderness. I leave Skolivar at anchor and take to the angling cot. A significant thing to do is this little blue boat from the Shannon Estuary is of pure Viking design. A tangible link with a thousand year old past. Vikings fascinate me because they're such a neglected strand in our history. Though it's the Normans who have left the most striking evidence of their visit to Rindun. Ancient battlegrounds are strange places. Violence echoes down the centuries. To think of ourselves as a Celtic people is politically correct, but historically inaccurate. We're the product of many waves of invasion, which left sedimentary layers of culture behind them. 
When you think of a Viking, we imagine a barbaric Danish pirate with horns on his helmet. Nothing could be further from the truth. But the Irish Vikings were not barbarians, and they never wore helmets with horns on. They just had a bad press. The only people who could write at the time were monks, who didn't like the Vikings because they weren't Christian, and so they retaliated by writing them into the history books as plundering monsters. Vikings. The word Norman means a man from the north, from Scandinavia. They were another branch of the same civilization who settled in France, conquered England, and then eventually ended up here on the shores of Loch Ree. This finger of land must be one of the most fought over places in the country. The battle lines can be traced back to the Stone Age. Blood soaking into the clay for thousands of years. And for what? Today, there's a clump of ruins, a bit of woodland, and some scruffy fields with sheep on them. It somehow doesn't seem worth it all. Isolated from the violence of the past and relax into boat talk and route planning. We're heading north up the Roscommon shoreline, making for Le Caro and the long run up the head of the lake to Lanesborough. to understanding a place is to get a feel for its history. But this doesn't just mean human history. Further up the shore, there's a wood, St. John's Wood, an ancient and a magic place that provides other clues to the past. It feels primeval. The primeval forest is its something of a, a holy grail in the context of Europe. It, it's questionable whether it exists anywhere in Western Europe. But nonetheless, there are ancient woodlands, woodlands that have the same species as the primeval forest, woodlands that have come down to us through time, surviving the various vicissitudes of cutting and um, in many cases replanting. Twenty-three native trees in this wood. Um, it's a matrix of hazel. Hazel is the most abundant, and the biggest trees are oak and ash, uh, quite a bit of elm, and then you've got some remarkable trees like the Irish white beam. It's our only endemic species, found nowhere else in the world but Ireland. generation we do see around the edges 
and of course some trees such as oak have a remarkable ability to re-sprout from the cut stumps some natural regeneration but it is a cause for concern why, why aren't there more young oak saplings we find young oak saplings around the edges but they're hard to find in the interior of the wood A wood like this is more than just a few hundred acres of trees. It's a clue to the old Ireland, the landscape we grew up in, that shaped and formed and made us 5,000 years ago. of canal which links the village of Lecaro with Loch Ree about halfway up the lake was constructed in the mid 1840s in order to gain access to quarries to bring down stone for the extensive navigation works which were being constructed in Athlone at that time. And of course all these navigation works in the 1840s were part of a government scheme to provide employment and the construction of this canal provided employment for about a hundred men a day uh, for the period when it was under construction so it was a very useful source of employment at that time. after the commercial traffic ceased on the Shannon and for many years boats couldn't get up it and uh, eventually as a result of pressure from the Inland Waterways Association uh, we had the, uh, the canal dredged out and, and reopened because it was a very important port of refuge for the increasing traffic on the river of pleasure boats who had very little very few places of refuge on Loch Ree, and uh, it's now become one of the uh, most popular ports of call for the visitors to the Shannon. The canal and harbour were built to create jobs. The whole waterway has been a source of employment since the first dugout canoe was commissioned. But this employment has never been more in demand than it is today. I write up the log, a diary of impressions from a long day's travel. Human history and natural history have become very closely entwined on this journey, a fascinating combination. The Caro is a port of refuge, refuge for us and for other creatures. About 15 species of otter in the world, um, by far the, the most important, certainly from our point of view, is the European otter, Lutra Lutra, which actually ranges from, um, from Ireland through Scandinavia to Japan, if you like, but um, over the whole of Europe, with the exception of parts of the highlands of Scotland and Ireland, it is either extinct or endangered. I mean, there are places in, in Holland where they nearly make a nature reserve if they see the sign that there's an otter in the area just because there's an otter in the area. O otters occupy a linear territory, a stretch of river or a stretch of, of lakeshore, and if human activity of some sort breaks up the necessary five miles or so of river that they need for a territory, 
then they move on. They can't make do with the two halves, one on either side of the town that's grown up, or the, or the holiday complex that's grown up, or the boating complex that's grown up. And also, of course, there's a question of pollution, which both affects the otter, affects its skin, affects its eyes, and affects its food, the fish. The wild creatures need peace and quiet. The waterway must not be disturbed. But that doesn't mean neglected. Some management is necessary for both animal and human use. must be cut to keep a channel open. Wild things need protection. We have responsibilities. We can no longer leave everything to nature. The Office of Public Works owns these ungainly mowing machines. They may look like fat steel ducks waddling down the canal, but they do far less ecological damage than chemical weed control. getting worse. We plough on towards Lanesborough at the head of the lake and it feels as though we'll never get there. As we batter against the water, my mind drifts back to the Vikings of Rindun. They gave us many things. They founded our first towns and by English people where we can enjoy some 20th century comfort. There was no place really for the tourists to go bar up to the pubs. There was no real restaurant for them to go and have a good meal. So Ronnie and Maureen came over from England and they were, I was talking to them before they first started and they told me what they wanted to do with the place and it sounded, you know, a really good choice or decision to do because there was, before they came there was nothing really here for tourists. Oh, mainly German, um, some French and Dutch and Swiss and then English and then the locals from Uscommon or Longford, you know, but they only make up a small proportion of the people that come to eat in the restaurant. Were you in Lanesborough in the old days? I was. I first came into Lanesborough in 1941. During the war? During the war, yes. Lanesborough must have looked a bit different in those days. It was completely different than today. Was the power station there? No. No way, no. <clears throat> did you have any rough days coming across the lake? I did. One of one that I remember that I blew on to Quaker Island. It was that rough that the diesel idle, the fuel idle went into fraud. And we got an airlock. And we got blown onto the island. We we're, were there for a night and a day. A night and a day? A night and a day we were there all day. And we had no food on, on the boat, you know. So there was a lot of wild goats out on the island. And we had a butcher working with us, you know. He, he'd done butchering before he joined us by his boat, man. And uh, we got a light line and we last it. Goat. Killed it. <laughs> Skinned it. Hung it up in the ballast tank. And every so often we'd go back and we'd cut a piece off it. Goat and fry it in the pan. <laughs> Real Robinson Crusoe can. More than that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. They were tough days, they were. In the morning, I must visit the thumping heart of Lanesborough the ESB generating station. The electricity supply board and board Namona, winning the peak to fuel the power station, work in partnership and dominate the economic life of the Midlands. To me, they symbolize a less pessimistic chapter in the history of this country, a time of patriotic vision and grand schemes to create prosperity. Well, we burn uh, of the order of 800,000 tonnes of mill peat a year. This is supplied from, by Bournemouth from local bogs in, in the vicinity of Lanesborough, anything from 2 to 15 miles from the station. It's supplied in, in trains or rakes of wagons, 15 wagons per train, and we consume, we utilise about anything between 40 and 50 train loads every day.
The hungry throat of the power station is gobbling down the Midland bogs. The easy environmental reflex is to condemn this, but it's meant a decent living for a generation of people. And though the bog is a thing of beauty and value, it's not necessarily a landscape for all time. serve some bog and still allow ourselves a sense of wonder and admiration for what's going on here, even if some easy preconceptions get overturned in the process. This whole operation is a vision, dating from an era when Irish people believed with passion that enough time had been spent dancing to the tune of all the invading cultures. Now we could compose our own music, and we would do it better. And there's another green paradox in Lanesborough, a couple of hundred yards from the power station. We get our heat here from the power station at Lanesborough. Hot water comes from the turbines, which is waste heat from the power station. And we extract heat from that and return it at a much lower temperature. The heat comes into a four-way valve and our computer decides how much heat we require in the glass and it takes whatever heat requires from that point and distributes it through the glasshouse and brings the temperature up to our optimal levels. It's uh, a very high tech. Um, it's completely computerized and automated. We have about four to five full-time people here employed and about five other people part-time for the summer. We're actually harvesting or picking tomatoes from around the end of February up to mid-November. They're principally sold in the western counties, in Galway, Mayo, Sligo and Roscommon. Um, we substitute imported tomatoes in those areas. We, in the past, we pollinated plants um, by a manual means, by going along and tapping each plant to shake the pollen around in the flower. But in the, la the last two years, we buy in bumblebees, and these, the bees go along and actually pollinate the flowers uh, seven days a week without any complaints. People who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Instead, they should stop to think thoughts about what is the acceptable price of progress and what is unacceptable. I leave Lanesborough behind, prompted into some environmental reassessments. My mind is unsettled, questioning in tune with the array of Atlantic weather fronts sailing in from the west. I feel I've learned something in this town, and learning is not always a comfortable process. I've been provoked. The tall stacks, plumed with steam, dominate the horizon long after the town itself drops out of sight. They look somehow as though they have not been built, but have germinated and grown here.
traveling into Ireland in a white teardrop. The journey started in Ballon Slow on the River Suck and progressed to bigger boats on bigger rivers. Through Loch Ree, a Sahara desert of water, some digressions into history and some foul weather. Through Lanesborough and a vision of an industrial future, upstream against the Shannon Current, port of departure for emigrants from the North Midlands. Thousands of men, women and children, fleeing famine, abandoned everything familiar for a desperate chance at a new life in a new world. And those who stayed at home built up a deposit of grief for lost family. sensitive to this legacy from the past, but aware of another agenda. The Royal Canal, the other canal, was a mistake, a cul-de-sac of early capitalism. From the start, it was a controversial undertaking, and Richmond Harbour is still, to some extent, a monument to failure. Harbour is the terminus of the Royal Canal, which links the northern end of the Shannon with Dublin, unlike the Grand Canal, which links Dublin with the Shannon round about the middle of the river, just north of Banagher. It's an interesting canal because uh, the, the story about it is that it was constructed out of peak by a, a, a ex-director of the Grand Canal Company who stormed out of his board meeting and said he was going to construct a rival canal. But the canal itself was an extraordinarily difficult canal to construct, partly because it was never really properly surveyed and they launched into building it without making correct plans and surveys of the route and they ran into enormous financial difficulties. And so the government instituted a major inquiry into both canal companies and finally wound up the Royal Canal Company and completed the canal to the Shannon using public funds. And then in the 1840s, the entire concern was bought by the newly set up Midland Great, Great Western Railway Company and this, of course, was the beginning of the end for the canal as a commercial concern. The 
19th century was the age of enlightenment and the seedbed for recession. But a commercial venture that lurched in a series of bad judgments into bankruptcy and dereliction is now being restored by engineers with a self-confident vision of a new kind of prosperity. We have a job, but it's uh, a fairly easy job uh, in this direct, direct area. Uh, we've only got the canal to dredge, uh, the old lock gates to take out, and the new lock gates to put in. Uh, in other locations of the canal, we have uh, a few low bridges. Uh, they will cause uh, more problems, but uh, nothing insurmountable. Well, the rate of restoration will depend on the resources that are made available, both financial and labour resources. Uh, but uh, it will be possibly uh, in, the, in the next 10 years or so. The locks will be restored as they were. Uh, timber will be mainly used, but we will also use steel. Well, hopefully I'll be in the first boat that travels on the canal from Richmond Harbour to Dublin or vice versa. But uh, it's something to look forward to. We leave Richmond Harbour intent on another piece of diversion an attempt to navigate a bit more of the Camlin River. It'll mean leaving industrial history behind and encountering a more natural world. The rectangular window of a 20th century bridge reveals a picture that is timeless and serene. And there are other subtle differences closing in. The landscapes take on the feel of Flemish painting big horizons and a waterway that meanders through flat land lined with willow, alder and poplar. on who's in it and what's outside it. Now we are quiet. Only our eyes move continuously as we absorb the scenery. And as the vistas progress, we start to see things differently. The Camlin River will be a circuitous shortcut across a bend of the Shannon. When we rejoin the big river, we'll head upstream again, through Loch Forbes, into Ruski, and then another lake crossing to Drummond Harbour. But first, the Little River. Beautiful and unspoilt, but requiring absolute attention to get a 40-foot boat around its slalom course of bends. In a boat, you have to keep up a certain minimum speed. If you don't, the rudder stops working and you lose control. And Scullivar's minimum speed seems far too fast along here. She seems at home, though. She was born in Holland 80 years ago, and this Flemish landscape suits her. This is one of the lonelier passages on the journey. We haven't seen another boat for hours. For me, these are always the best bits. I find the wealth of wildlife better company. Well, there's quite a lot of butterflies. The Shannon is a very good area for butterflies. The main reason for that is that there is quite an array of plants. And an area like we're in now, which is an overgrown wilderness, is absolutely ideal for butterflies. If you tried to create it, you couldn't do a better job than nature's done here. Generally, the life of a butterfly is about a fortnight. There's three exceptions to this, the brimstone, the peacock, and the small tortoiseshell. 
these butterflies hibernate, but all of them have exactly the same life cycle. It starts with the butterfly laying an egg, and the butterfly can lay up to 250 eggs. In the wild, probably one, maybe two butterflies will be all that will emerge through at the end of the life cycle. But it goes from the egg to a caterpillar. And an interesting little aside is that a caterpillar eats so much that if you were to, to relate that to human terms, if a baby ate what a caterpillar eats, he'd be 10 tons weight by the time that same baby was a week old. This year we have the clouded yellow, which is a migrant butterfly. It's rarely seen, but this year it's along all the shores of the Shannon. And also the brimstone, which is another bright yellow butterfly. And in fact, that's the, where the name butterfly came from. This bright yellow butterfly in Victorian times, people used to say, look at the butter-coloured fly. It is felt that the protection that a butterfly gets is often by a flash of colour and the theory is that that confuses the predator and in the case of the eye spots that you can see on the peacock butterfly this eye spot is designed again to frighten a bird or in some cases to act as a mimic eye so that if a bird pecks at the eye all that happens to the butterfly is that he has a torn wing rather than losing his head which is really where his eyes are. To lose my head, I waltz around the Camlin River bends, getting pleasure from the challenge of it, enjoying boating in the sunshine. Some of the alder trees are dead. This worries me. Is it the effect of drought or a virus? Is something unsound in this apparent paradise? Then I forget about it. It's impossible to really worry about anything on a glorious river, on a glorious day, in good company. If you have something preying on your mind, anything, however weighty, I guarantee you peace and absolution if you open yourself up to an experience as beautiful as this. Irish waterways form corridors of wilderness across the country, narrow strips where birds, animals and plants have it their own way. Dick Carney, Declan and I feel like privileged visitors in someone else's place. We don't say much, maybe something articulate like, it's great, isn't it? It is. I stop to rest muscles tired out by the heavy tiller and get a closer look at the bankside riches. Alder is an excellent tree. It fixes its own nitrogen like peas and beans, so it can pioneer wet soils, poor in nutrients. The spikes of purple loosestrife make bold strokes of colour in the green tapestry. The white umbellifers are hard plants to identify. This one is wild angelica, an edible plant but dangerous because it has some poisonous look-alikes. Oh, and this is interesting, a flowering head of hempagrimony, the only member of the cannabis family that grows wild outside the tropics. And our diversion is over. Scolivar sticks her blunt nose out of the Camlin River onto the Shannon again.
Forbes opens up. There's amazing variety to this navigation, from tight canals and narrow twisting river stretches to this, all in the space of half a day. in hiding up a tree on an old estate on the lake shore. This, this site here on the Shannon was really the beginning of one of the most dynamic things that's happened in um, mammalogy in Ireland in the, last, um, in the last century, really. The addition of a completely new and very successful species. What happened was that the Earls of Granard, a daughter of the house was getting married in 1911 and amongst her wedding presents there was a hamper of grey, squ grey squirrels sent over by the Duke of Bedford from Woburn Abbey, now a famous wildlife park and obviously even then in the business of exporting wildlife. And as part of the wedding celebrations the hamper was open and the squirrels scampered off into the beech trees here. And um, from that single reintroduction the species has spread over the whole of the Midlands of Ireland and is now um, way down into Munster. Around the Shannon we have estate woodlands, hedgerow woodlands, mixed woodlands, a lot of beech, a lot of ash, a lot of oak by Irish standards. And this is where the grey squirrel survives because that's what it comes from. It's, it comes from this sort of habitat in, in North America. If you read the early literature, you'll find um, people who um, averred passionately that not only did the grey squirrel, which is bigger than the red squirrel, chase the red squirrel out of its uh, native habitat, but also when they caught the red squirrels, they used to emasculate them, they used to bite the testicles off, and then let the red squirrels go again. Um, for which there is, I'm, I'm afraid, no evidence whatsoever, but it's, a, it's, it's an example of, if you like, the Victorian imagination running a little, a little wild. Now, what seems to happen is that in the habitats for which they're better suited, the grey squirrel will quietly exclude the red. of civilization after our short retreat and practical things like needing diesel to keep Scolivar motoring against the current. This isn't country anymore, it's country and western, midwestern. Pepsi Cola and popsicles have replaced peacock butterflies and pastoralism. I suppose that now we're sucking diesel. of travelling like this, your brain begins to interpret signals in another way. Visual perception is a very subjective thing, which I guess is another way of saying that everyone sees things differently. The Flemish master who painted the skies along the Camlin River has retired his easel, and another landscape school has taken over. I can't quite place this one. Maybe Jack Yates, around the time he was starting to take liberties with colour. There's another change. A mad surrealist welcomes us to Ireland's strangest shop, the Drummond Mariner. This is 
through the looking glass, from Mary Lou in Disneyland to Lewis Carroll's Wonderland. It's so strange the proprietor takes pains to discourage custom and finds you a pound if you still dare to penetrate the door to look at the treasures inside. Oh, we get all sorts of customers. We charge a pound to keep them out, you see. They're very allergic to the poor ones, you know, the poor people are all a nuisance. But then, of course, the millionaire, he's very shy, he's very shy to give me the pound either. Like, I, I noticed a lot of you fellas today didn't pay. So what can I do about it? God help us. Bound in never of war and the troch of many a bit. Sure to am a mistral of his honor. Where have I got to? Asleep, maybe? A character in Alice's dream? Well, when I first came here 25 years ago, you had a lot of rich people came on those boats. But now you get an awful lot of jackies on there, you see. They hire a boat for four and about eight or ten of them down it. And they'd move, they're the greatest movers I ever met. They'd move everything on you, you know. I wouldn't be, be, would be very reluctant to pay for it. for the Mad March Hare, or a top hat for ten and sixpence. You see, they, they hire these boats, you see, and then they haven't got no money to spend, so they're not much good to me, are they? An awful lot of rubbish comes out of that river. An awful lot of... Of course, there are some lovely things to come out of it, too. God bless their little hearts. Some lovely little things. Oh, my God, yes. I leave unsure whether I'm one of the lovely things. One thing's certain, the North Midlands of Ireland are a great place for the colourful and the exotic. Let's travel on to Xanadu. the Shannon and into Loch Ree, with island landfalls and exploration of the hinterland. We digressed into forgotten backwaters and lost harbours slumbering through history, and the twisting channel of the Camlin River bringing us back
of fencing you can achieve in territory like this. There are curlews of the imagination that suddenly go crying through the waste spaces in the mind. It can be a solitary vice messing about in boats, particularly if you have a fondness for backwaters and little rivers where the hire cruisers seldom go. There's a history to hire cruising on the Shannon, quite a recent history. We were out in India and my husband's mother sent us a book called Green and Silver, which is of a cruise up the canal and on the Shannon. And it sounded so attractive that my husband got the idea of starting up hire cruises because uh, we wanted to get away from India anyway. And we came back in, I suppose, 1957 and did a car tour of the river and picked where we thought we would like to start a business. We experimented with what people liked, what people wanted, and gradually got ourselves established. But we did build our own boats. At that time, we couldn't find any glass fibre boats that we felt were suitable for the river. We had, incidentally, four sailing boats as well as some motor cruisers. And our customers were almost entirely English. And then when the troubles on the north started up, they stopped coming. And uh, the other companies then began to go for the German market. Getting away from it all is the cliché, but that's rather negative. I think the Germans in the hire cruisers and the Irish in their own boats are not just escaping lives of quiet desperation. They're also discovering positive things about themselves and their relationship with this environment. There's a passage in an old guide to the Shannon which catches the mood. This is a place of quiet contemplation, where the wireless should be turned off, for its sound seems rude and vulgar in the great solitude that encompasses the traveller on every side. We have left our northerly migration route to travel west on a long digression into County Roscommon. Limestone land is lush and there's little traffic. Our destination is Grange Harbour, waterways port for nearby Strokestown. Even the harbour is a soft green place, a little bit of nature tidied up, but not defeated. But Strokestown is actually some distance from its port, which means another form of transport. I lived on Haight and Ashbury. It all comes crowding back. Hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids you killed today? I thought of putting flowers in my hair, but it wasn't practical. Too much wind. Hippies never die, they just get mortgages. As I arrive, 
find I've traveled back much further than 1967. Strokestown is the last um, of the great Roscommon houses and there were over 20 of them less than 150 years ago and it's all that remains of that tradition, the ascendancy in this part of the country and also at, at its height here the estate um, controlled 30,000 acres. Well, all of Pakenamahan um, was born an only child into the house in the 1890s and in 1914 married Edward Stafford King Harmon from Rockingham and Boyle and it was really this great sort of point of optimism, the two biggest houses in the county united and they, you know, between them had about 60,000 acres of land and a big London wedding and they came back to live at Rockingham because it was the grandeur of the two places and he went off to fight in the war and was, went missing in action almost immediately and she had to wait about seven years in Rockingham until he was presumed dead and then moved back here. Well, it's not a ruin because of the intervention of Westward Garage, you know, who bought the house uh, complete with its contents, which included all of the estate papers. And uh, this small Strokestown-based company have um, initiated what is now regarded as the best private restoration project anywhere in Ireland. The house is already financially self-supporting. Um, it obviously doesn't generate the sort of funds necessary to develop the museum or restore the gardens, but um, it's actually running itself at the moment not making a huge fortune, I might add, but um, as they say in this part of the country, wiping its face. But it's very important that um, people be made aware of, you know, our history, because, you know, there's no other way of understanding what's going on now without obviously rooting it, you know, in sort of traditions that go back several centuries. What we are doing now is leaving the great western diversion of Grange Loch and Carnado and heading back north through the gullet of Bodurg and into Loch Tap. The route then winds up the map with a target of Carrick on Shannon by nightfall. But I'm going to abandon ship and use the little blue angling cot that's been following like a faithful dog all the long miles to here. Dick Carney will take over the tiller and follow the navigation into the Jamestown Cut and through the Albert Lock, while racing round the shallow loop of river that the canal avoids and explore part of the Shannon that's seldom seen. The little boat puts me in a much closer relationship with the water. A shift of balance on the gunwale dips towards the swamping point. A wrist flick of the paddle and I travel several yards. This is essential boating, the maximum of contact and the minimum of technology. I have laid down a challenge, muscle against motor. This journey was getting just a bit too easy. I want to up the ante. It was my idea. I think the others reckon I'm cracking up, getting a bit strange. Anyway, I'll give them a run for their money. With any luck, there'll be a queue for the lock and they'll get held up. Mind you, they're probably glad to be rid of me. Looking forward to having the boat to themselves and a leisurely trip along the canal. As I reach the bridge of Drumsnar, which marks the limit of navigation for ordinary craft, I become absorbed in what I'm doing and rededicated to the purpose of my journey. This river was the invasion route for the Viking boat people, who were my ancestors and who left such an undervalued legacy for everyone who's Irish. I follow in their wake, trying to understand them better so I can improve my understanding of myself.
I don't think the others took my challenge seriously. From the beginning, they've been a bit suspicious of the cot, which always creates problems in locks and when we go astern. And Dick Carney knows this river a lot better than I do. Something I glimpse behind his glasses makes me think he already has an idea who is going to win. The angling cot from the estuary of the Shannon is a pure Viking design, still in use after over a thousand years. And this landscape is very like what those Norse explorers must have seen. Scolivar has diesel horsepower on her side, and there's virtually no current in the canal cut. She has to be the favourite in the race, unless, like Aesop's hair, they get overconfident and stop to take too long a break. When the first Vikings arrived, we had no word for the astonishing new technology of planked boats. So we did the best we could. We adapted the name of our clumsy Irish dugouts and learn to build better craft. summer sun must have seemed exotic to the hardy Scandinavians. I feel the ancestral escorts drawing closer. They're looking for company. Now it's they who are a little lonely. The currents strengthen me and my arms ache. Now I need help and inspiration to push on past the point at which under normal circumstances I'd quit the whole attempt. The Vikings don't give up easily. I'm starting to think that it's not so much a question of whether I'll win the race, but whether I'll finish at all. into hidden times and places. It's hard to explain to them how great the experience was. The strength of the current and the fatigue are easy and obvious. mysterious sensations trickle through the fingers of vocabulary. I motor on upstream with singing muscles as the sun drops down a big horizon. We're trying to pick up lost time to make Carrick on Shannon before dark. It seems so effortless, this travelling with an engine. The skies are getting bigger as we go northwards, and the sun sinks on the slow, dimmer switch of a summer evening in high latitudes.
watch it all quietly from the cockpit, content to let the bridge of Carrick approach at its own speed. When full dark finally arrives, I take out my logbook and pen and try and put down on paper some of the sensations of that lonely paddle against the current. My overriding impression was that the waterway did not want me to penetrate its mysteries. I wake next morning to find myself a bit disorientated by the bustle of Carrick. It's a boating centre, both for hiring cruisers on the North Shannon and for building them. Well, this whole operation here commenced by a gentleman called Brian Kennedy, a naval architect by profession, and he approached me three, four years ago to build steel hull cruisers on the Shannon, primarily to sell to the higher boat industry. At this stage, I suppose we made the classic mistake that we did not go to the higher companies first, but rather we presented them with a product. And even at that, we were very disappointed to, at the reaction we felt that maybe, that first of all, we had a good product, we thought. It was Irish built, providing employment for the region. But the reaction was, was basically, I wouldn't say negative, just no interest. As businessmen, we realized that you have to, you know, change course sometimes. We established a market as higher boat operators in Germany. We had confirmations from the major operators that they would take our boats on hire for the 92 season. We then put together our package and set about producing cruisers. The essential point that did come out from all our research was that the end user, i.e. the visitor to Ireland, he required a quality product, and the Germans in particular have, a, have a, a preference for steel, and the reaction was very, very positive. Age talks to age, generation to generation. The shadowy flock of ancestors that had been following me up the river were coming closer again. Carrick has its ghosts of the past too. Some live in the Costello Memorial Chapel, the second smallest chapel in the world. It may be small, but it was built from the same motives as the Taj Mahal, the love of a man for his wife. Edward Costello's beloved wife died in 1877. In his grief, he built the little chapel over her coffin. Now they both lie here, side by side, beneath plate glass panes in the floor. It's a place that generates a certain respect. Outside in the strong daylight is a modern contrast to the dedication of Edward Costello. There's a great tradition of rowing in the town itself, and this is one of the oldest rowing clubs in the country. We started as a schoolgirls four, and then for job reasons, um, the other girls had to drop out. So I continued and I went single sculling and um, I raced at different levels here in Ireland and on the continent at international level. Well, I got to one Olympics, the Moscow ones in 1980. Um, I finished seventh. I missed the, the big final by I think 16 hundredths of a second, but that's the way it goes. It's a very skillful sport. You have to be terribly fit. I used to train um, 
about six hours most days, seven days a week. You need a very good coach, you need good equipment, um, you'd have to have a lot of time and you'd need to be dedicated. As we cast off, I feel we're leaving one of the few places in Ireland which takes boating as seriously as I do. So many towns along the river seem to ignore its presence, but Carrick really lives for and from the water. Well, for instance, in high season, there are between 800 and 1,000 extra people per week coming on the Shannon, just to Carrick and Shannon. And that represents almost 50% of an increase in the population of the town, so those figures, I think, speak for themselves. Uh, people from mainland Europe, especially, find the attraction of this area very, very strong. And some of the things that keep coming across are the clean air, the clean water, the quiet. It's a great saving in doctor's bills. The uh, switch-off effect of a boating holiday is marvellous. Trying to save money on my medical expenses, I head northwards again, up the narrowing Shannon, through some small lakes. The backdrop of rolling green hills and tufts of woodland. Gentle, clean landscape. We come to a confluence and leave the Shannon once again in another piece of diversion. This time we take the left-hand fork and head into the Boyle River, first stop, Coot Hall. The river is twisty and interesting. The banks have come closer, which gives the impression that we're going faster a fluid speed swaying left and right like a skater over ice. Seen from space, the earth is blue and green. And here too, it's revealed in its true colors. There are a lot of truths in travel. We're in the headwaters, Coot Hall. We still have river to travel, places to explore, and another rendezvous with history. and into the Shannon. Time off to explore around Loch Ree and into harbour in Lanesborough. More exploration of the Royal Canal and Richmond Harbour. Scolivar, our Dutch barge yacht, has carried us along the endless road to discovery. Today I'm in Boyle, and I was going to say I'm in hot water, but it's not. It's breathtakingly cold. 
The idea was to use the faithful angling cot to glide down the couple of miles of fast river between the town and Loch Key with its forest park. The reality feels more like a commando assault course. There's a knack to this. I used to do a bit of canoeing once, and a cot is like a slightly unwieldy canoe. You have to anticipate, to read the water ahead, and work out well in advance where the snags are and where you'll get the best flow of deep, fast water to carry you downstream. You don't use the paddle for propulsion as much as for steering. The river current does the hard work. You become so engrossed in another world when you're travelling a river. Now I can relax enough to enjoy the challenge around the next bend and appreciate the beauty of the surroundings. It's a little bit of wilderness and wilderness is a treat. The assault course finally reaches Drum Bridge, which looks a bit military too, as though it was thrown up in a hurry by infantry advancing on an urgent objective. After the excitement of the fast river, a total change of pace and mood. We're entering a land of fantasy in the cot and by canal. Rockingham, the old Ascendancy estate which preceded the forest park of today, has its own miniature waterways network, a system of weed-choked canals. Some of these canals are follies, fantasies, whims, a fairyland created by a wealthy landlord for his amusement and the entertainment of his guests. Others had a practical purpose. They were used to bring boatloads of turf to feed the hungry throats of the dozens of fireplaces that kept the big house warm in winter. The King Harmons, landlords of Rockingham, have left, and so have their guests. Weeds are growing in fairyland. The dream has gone wild. seems to be a symbolism to the rain, a cold shower to cool down the fantasy, a reminder of the fact of change. It never rained in fairyland. Strokestown House and Rockingham were the two greatest great houses in Roscommon. They united in an unlucky marriage early this century, unlucky because the groom was killed almost immediately in the First World War. Rockingham certainly had the best views. The stable block escaped the fire that destroyed the house, but there's no longer any orders to harness the Landau or the outside car. No longer a bell calling the ladies and gentlemen to morning prayer. We've stayed a little too long among the relics of old decency, 
Wind has come after the rain, raising choppy waves on the lake. We must push Skolivar into them to make shelter for the night. Navigation is not permitted after dark on this waterway, but we want to make Clarendon Lock in time to get a quiet berth where we can sleep without the angry sounds of water slapping the steel hull and wind whistling across the superstructure. We find our calm haven, sleep in shelter, the deep and satisfying sleep that comes after exertion of the muscles and the senses. A thin skin of metal separates us from a world of plants and fish and birds, a world full of small miracles of evolution which the morning reveals. The Shannon being the largest river in Ireland, has all of the migratory species available in it that we have in Ireland. It has the Atlantic salmon, which as you know, stays in fresh water for two years, and then is a very tiny little smolt of maybe three or four inches long, heads down along the Shannon, and has already put in maybe 100 miles by the time it reaches the sea. It then goes to sea and travels another 1,000 miles out to sea, grows for a year, and then comes all the way back to the very spot where it was reared. Then you have the eels, which do this in complete reverse. They come from the Saragossa Sea, just off Barbados. They move upstream into the Shannon, go into every tiny little tributary and loch, and then, when they've stayed there for maybe 12 or 14 years, they return to the sea to spawn. Now our migration rejoins the upper reaches of the Shannon and passes under Hartley Bridge, an elegant arch dating from the 1930s and a chapter heading in the history of Irish architecture because it was one of the first large structures in the country made of reinforced concrete. waters now, but it's difficult to say exactly where the Shannon navigation ends. Drum Bridge on the Boyle River is the limit for large craft on the northwestern spur. On the Shannon proper, there's one possible ending at Leitrim Village, though once it was more a beginning than an end, and it will be so again. Acres Lake outside Drum Shambo is the final port of call we've picked, though again, it wasn't always a terminus, and it won't always be one. This confusion arises because waterways shrink and grow according to the climate of history. The Ballinamore Ballyconnell Canal connecting the Shannon to the Urn was intended to be the last link in an inland navigation chain from Limerick to Belfast. The chain was broken, but it's under repair. Well, the original canal was built between uh, 1845 and 1863. Um, it was really almost part of a famine relief scheme at the time. And just by way of scale at that time, it involved the uh, employment of 7,000 people. It was not a successful project, both for engineering reasons and for commercial reasons. By any standard, this is a very large project. Uh, the total cost is about 30 million, which puts it into the category of one of the largest projects going on in the country at the moment. The canal itself is 64 kilometers long. It has 16 locks, eight of which have to be completely reconstructed, 32 bridges, all of which require structural work, and indeed some of them new bridges entirely. We saw this Shannon Erin link as something which we could be associated with and which served the kind of objectives we have in relation to the community and a community-based company. And so for this reason, uh, we were anxious to promote and to help a project like this to move forward. 
uh, there has been tremendous interest in it, both, both from the boating point of view uh, and indeed from uh, entrepreneurs on either side of the canal who see this as an opportunity, a business opportunity for the future. And that has been a very important uh, consideration in our planning of this canal. So I think it's going to be a tremendous success. I'm reminded again of a topical fact. The waterways are, and always have been, about the creation of wealth and jobs. There's a future to this river, obvious to anyone with the smallest bit of vision. The progress that the development of the Shannon navigation can bring is the best kind of progress, because it has a vested interest in preserving all this green wilderness. The creation of employment need not be at the expense of nature. I'm approaching my last canal. The final destination is drawing depressingly near. The Loch Allen Canal was built early in the last century, but it also became derelict. It was reopened after a campaign by local people and waterways enthusiasts in 1978, as far as Acres Lake. If you pick your pace, a lock in the sunshine is one of the most soothing places in the world. The smell of water weeds in the empty chamber. A lullaby of rushing water. Time to chat with volunteers on the lock beams. In the old days when communications were simpler, canals were conduits for news and information. The conversation of the lock had weight and importance. The tradition hasn't entirely died. There are ghosts left of the men who brought news of the progress of Napoleon's war or the health of Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria's health is on my mind as I thread the boat up the narrow cut, or at least it seems just about as relevant to my present state was the news I overhear on Dick Carney's transistor radio. The soap opera of current affairs, which obsesses us so much, became meaningless many miles down river. My favorite program now is the weather forecast. This canal with its mind-altering powers was built for a mundane reason, to carry coal from Arigna to Dublin. The forerunners of Shannon Navigation actually constructed the Loch Allen Canal back in the years 1818 to 1822. Uh, the main purpose was to afford the transportation of coal, iron, clay from the western shores of Loch Allen uh, around the Arigna area. The works, the iron and coal works themselves, never really developed as fully as hoped. The commercial traffic didn't appear in the volumes expected. And the construction of the Balnamora Rigna branch of the Cavan and Leith from Lloyd Railway virtually put an end to commercial traffic on the navigation. time immemorial men have picked at the coal seams, just as men have always floated in boats on the rivers and the lakes. But business interests developed, expanded and improved on both the coal extraction and the waterways. Barges loaded coal at the foot of the mountain, crossed the lake and entered the canal at Drumshambo. The last boat travelled the route in 1932, but in the very near future boats will travel it again. Constructing a two-way navigation lock to enable uh, boats to pass through from Shambo Bridge into Loch Allen. The lake at the moment is under the control of the ESB and they, under the statutory powers, 
are allowed to fluctuate the, the lake by approximately 15 and a half feet. Now you could have the situation that the lake would be higher than the canal. In that case you were locked down from the lake into the canal. Where in another situation you could have the lake lower than the canal. In that case you would lock up into the canal. are the punctuation marks that give meaning and order to a waterway. This is the last lock on the last canal on this journey. I shall miss Scolivar. A boat acquires a personality more quickly than any other inanimate object I can think of. This one is a lady of character with an interesting past. She's felt the hand of many masters on her tiller. She survived two world wars, saw good times and bad, and here she is, still doing the job, making sturdy progress up her remote Irish waterway. You've got to admire her. reading something last night by a Quaker botanist called Sarah Martha Baker, who lived in those Edwardian days when Scolivar was born. She believed, the universe is always singing, and that man must learn to listen so that his heart may join the universal chorus. The idea has been swimming around in my head all day, like a fish in a tank. easy even if you don't have to be six foot tall and very strong to cast out it's a pole fishing rod um, it's about seven meters long and the line is the same length so when I pull in the fish actually comes to my hand there's no reel on it and because it's such a calm day it's more sensitive fishing rod and it's easier to fish with. Well, you have to concentrate on the float because the minute it goes down, you have to be, to see it, you have to be quick to pull in. It's more in the knack, as I said, of pulling the fish in rather than strength. And probably women feel inhibited about going fishing. But once you start, it's, it's quite enjoyable and it's very relaxing. I mean, it's a good way to get away from everything. I have about 10 pound I'd say in the net at the moment. I've been fishing for the last two hours but um, people who come fishing here sometimes can get up to 100 pound weight of hybrid fish in a day. Also we have avid fishermen who come every year and on holidays here from England, all over Europe, France, Germany, but in general people
the early 70s, a sum of money became available to Leitrim County Council. My father, uh, my late father, was at that time in the process of putting plans together for an outdoor leisure centre in this area, and he immediately uh, got the county councillors to agree to the provision of uh, 25,000 pounds. As a result, by 1972, we had an open-air heated swimming pool, children's playground, and two hardcore tennis courts. All that now in the past, the boat started coming up here in the mid-70s, and he then proceeded to encourage Borne Fallship to locate the Chalk Kjol here, as he felt that with more and more boats coming to the area, that there was a need to provide some local entertainment. Hence, hey presto, our local amenity scheme, which we're all very proud of. As my last day on the water ages gracefully into evening, the past seems to re-emerge from the shadows. The landscape retains its essential nature and the modern alterations dim away. I made this journey because I believe that the country I live in is the product of many layers of invading culture. And if you travel properly, it's possible to peel back the layers and establish a very direct contact with ancestral influences. It seems appropriate that our last supper together should be an atavistic meal. We eat, as so many generations of river travelers have eaten, by a fire of branches on the shore. And we think back. up it, looking, searching, questioning, tried to untangle the complicated ball of wool that knits together to make a modern Irishman. I have travelled through great beauty to some measure of understanding. You cannot ask for more than that. Yeah. 